Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Kujio. My name is Sunny Agarwal. And today we have on with us Anthony Lusardi, who is the director of the Ethereum Classic Cooperative. Uh, Anthony, glad to have you on the show. Hey, Sonny. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, can you go ahead and introduce yourself and, you know, a little bit about yourself, how you got involved in the space and yeah. Okay, great. So I first got involved in cryptocurrencies, not in a very... <laughs> Uh, in a very typical way. So in about like 2014, I was spending, you know, 10 or 20 bucks at a time on Dogecoin, Redcoin, a bunch of crappy little coins where I was like, they're going to pull a Bitcoin and go way up. And I still actually own that $10 worth of Dogecoin. Uh, and so at the start, I was just kind of like a lot of people, they just hear that there's easy fast money here and you short term trade it and everything's great. But then I started actually reading a lot more about blockchain itself and what it gives us. And I got really interested in it far beyond uh, the trading aspect of it. And so in about 2015, I heard about Ethereum. I looked at it just a little bit. Then the crowd sale kind of happened without me even realizing it about three to six months after the crowd sale ended is when I started to act re actually really looking at Ethereum and really getting interested and joined the Ethereum community. So I was just on the subreddits. I was posting a lot. I wasn't really doing anything, though, in any sort of official capacity. I was just a big fan. And after that, you know, the DAO hack happened, then the DAO refund happens a month later, and then I've been working on ETC mostly in a volunteer capacity up until February of this year, end of February, early March, when I joined the ETC cooperative, and now I'm doing ETC full-time. And so what were you doing? Were you, were you doing any development uh for sort of the Ethereum code base prior to the to the fork and the DAO hack? No, I wasn't doing any development. I still don't really do development. I do program occasionally, but those are either my own projects or they're very small things. I wouldn't consider myself an ETC or Ethereum developer. I see. And so what was like your experience during the uh, DAO hack? Uh, you know, were you, did you, had you had bought into the DAO? What was like, were you watching it as it happened? Uh, what was that whole experience like for you? So I didn't buy into the DAO for a long time. Uh, I think I bought into it about a week or two before the DAO hack. Basically, I, I FOMO'd in just a tiny little bit. Uh, the reason I didn't buy into the DAO initially is because I do program occasionally and I didn't look at the code at all. I just saw that there was this super big, super complex project being launched on a blockchain where you're not supposed to be able to change it after. And the code seemed like it had been written very fast and very rushed. So I just thought to myself, there's probably bugs here and I'll just sit this out and wait until that part gets fixed. And yeah, that was my interest in the DAO at the time. I thought it was really cool. I thought it was great to be able to give the community a, and a way to invest in this fledgling ecosystem. It's just unfortunate it played out the way it did. And what, what were your thoughts about sort of as the as the Ethereum community tried to pick up the pieces and came up with the idea for the fork, uh, you know, what were your thoughts about it then? Were you, you know, already against the fork uh, when it was proposed by the foundation or is it something that came uh, later on? Yes, yeah, so I don't know if the foundation would agree that they proposed the fork. Uh, that's up to them though to argue, but I was completely against the fork. At the start, I didn't think 
that a fork would happen at all to re to refund the DAO. Uh, mainly for two reasons. One, Ethereum and all their communications were saying that this is an unstoppable blockchain and code is law and all that fun stuff. And then in the DAO contract itself, it basically said the code of the DAO supersedes the written contract. Uh, whether or not legally that's enforceable is rather an interesting question since you can't expect people to be able to properly evaluate the code of the DAO for most investors. But at the same time, I just... I couldn't I couldn't understand why we would, you know, fork the DAO and do this refund and potentially cause damage to the blockchain when previously we all agreed that even if the DAO, even if the DAO contract didn't say that, we all agreed that these are the rules at the start of the game. We can't change the rules in the middle of the game because that's unfair to some people who are playing by the same rules. Right, cool. And so obviously, you know, you weren't the only one with this viewpoint. There was a number of people who shared that, and this is kind of what led us to this uh, existence of Ethereum Classic. Uh, you know, so let's fast forward a little bit. Uh, a few months ago, the um, Ethereum Classic Cooperative was created. Uh, could you tell us, and now you're the director of this uh, organization, uh, could you tell us a little bit about what the Ethereum Classic Cooperative is, what its mission is, what is the goal, etc.? Yes, so actually to kind of correct that slightly, the Ethereum Classic Cooperative started back, I think, in April of 2017, but it was rather understaffed. Uh, and so when I joined is when it started to really take off. And what the Ethereum class, what, what the ETC cooperative is, it's essentially an organization to fill in where we have all these different pain points. So, for example, you may have uh, maybe Parity has, I actually just submitted a PR this morning where they needed a little support for ETC there and somebody to check and do something. So I did it. There's a lot of community management that needs to happen and needs to be done, so we do that. There's more awareness raising that needs to happen, so we do that. We are planning an ETC summit in September of this year in Seoul, South Korea, so we're managing that. There's a lot of things where people kind of look at these blockchain projects as if everything is grassroots and everything is these good, happy feelings, but really, you you need money and you need people working behind that in order to get it. So I'll go into later why ETC maybe uh, does things a little differently so that when you have money being invested in the platform, it's not such that it's going to have undue influence uh, compared to area, other blockchains where it might be a bit more centralized. But... Yeah, we still need these things, and particularly for ETC, we've suffered on awareness simply because nobody has been doing anything to improve awareness. Every A lot of other blockchains have a group or a set of people that help with that, and ETC, largely because of its origins and initial lack of funding, fell behind in that aspect, though still actually has maintained its lead in a lot of other areas. So what do you consider, like, you know, what you described seems to be sort of what the uh, role of the Ethereum Foundation is, or at least is supposed to be. So what do you can say that, like, the uh, ETC Cooperative is sort of like the, uh, you know, that equivalent to the Ethereum Foundation, uh, but for the ETC community? Sort of. So I would say the one main difference is we don't do everything. We don't do the majority of the development that's handled by ETC Dev and IOHK. And we don't really like to involve ourselves with that part too much unless it's something like Parity needs some help and it doesn't fall under the purview of somebody else. Uh, ETC Dev, of course, also ports code and writes code for Parity too, so I don't want to take away from that. But what Ethereum Foundation does 
is they kind of do everything for Ethereum. They do all the awareness and marketing. They do the programming. They do all the event planning. Uh, they do, you know, all all those different grants to different uh, people who are involved. And so on ETC, we try and do it differently. Like we have ETC Labs, for example, that now does grants uh, or s initial funding for for startups on that are running on ETC. Uh, we Ethereum ETC Cooperative then is what does some more of the awareness and community stuff. And then the various dev teams do the other part. And then, of course, we have volunteers that uh, also do some moderation and other things. But we try and keep it a bit more separate. So you can imagine that all these pieces are all individually and independently run. Whereas for Ethereum Foundation, it's all the one cohesive whole. And there's positives and negatives to both of those approaches, obviously. And so, you know, looking, looking back now, you know, we've had the Ethereum Foundation for a couple of years and, you know, we can certainly sort of look at some of the successes and failures there. In your opinion, sort of what are the things that with this organization you wish to maybe do differently or uh, to emulate from the Ethereum Foundation? From the Ethereum Foundation, I don't know exactly what we're trying to emulate here. We're just trying to accomplish the same goals as... Ethereum Foundation, Litecoin Foundation, Zcash, uh, Monero, I, I don't know if they have a foundation, but whatever they have, we're just trying to uh, fulfill some missing roles, uh, you know, that I mentioned, but there's no, there's no like, there's no set thing that we want to do. There's no set mission. It's simply to get people aware of ETC, using ETC and helping out wherever help is needed for ETC, kind of, you know, covering any any base that's not covered. Like yeah, okay, providing leadership to the ETC community, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's that's fair. That's a fair analysis. And well, just one question. So it, it, it's it's called uh, the Ethereum Classic Cooperative. So legally, actually a, a cooperative. Uh, where, is it, where is it based? Uh, how, how is it structured as, a, as an organization? So currently it's an LLC. We're applying to, for a nonprofit status and hoping to get that approved closer towards the end of the year. And that's where we want to be, where we're functioning as a nonprofit and able to help uh, develop ETC in a way that isn't, doesn't have specific commercial interests. You mentioned that we have all of these like multiple teams and stuff. Um, could you like give us like a quick summary of like who are the players in the Ethereum Classic uh, community? Uh, what are like uh, some of the main major dev teams and such? Yes, so we've got a bunch of different teams. First, of course, I want to shout out to all the community members, uh, Fyro, Omni Edge, and a whole bunch of others that I probably don't have time to mention. They're they do a lot of stuff for ETC that just goes unnoticed for the most part. So they're really important to us, even though they're not, you know, on a specific uh, team. They're just on Team ETC. But as far as the teams go, we have ETC Dev that's lit, led by Igor Artamanov, who has been involved in ETC since the start. They do a lot of the core development for ETC. So Spudnik VM, which Sonny, I know you're a big fan of, they've developed that. Uh, and they're doing Emerald Projects slash SDK, which is essentially a tool chain to, to enable developers to more easily work on ETC without having to roll everything yourself. Right now, every blockchain, you roll everything you need yourself. And so they're doing that. And they actually just hired a great guy, Darcy Reno, who's doing a lot of the day-to-day -day product project management. So uh, they're a team in total of about, I think, 10 people right now. And they're looking to double towards the end of the year, hit 20. So they're growing pretty rapidly and producing a lot for ETC. Then there's IOHK, which of course is led by Charles Hoskinson, and he's dedicated a group of people 
for the past two years as well since he was involved since the start and they're developing things for etc too i'm actually waiting to hear on what their remaining roadmap is i'm actually told there's going to be some surprises from them for, at the summit which i don't even know which is actually kind of fun because i don't know everything about etc and it's great that we're that distributed <laughs> uh to reach that point and but yeah they've so far developed the mantis client and then they were working on integrating etc and cardano so they could swap currencies between each other so that's really interesting then beyond that we have uh etc labs who is the one investing in startups they're doing seed funding for them and in exchange for a small percentage of the company you know giving them office space uh mentorship and all that nice stuff so i'm really looking forward to see what comes out of them and then we also on the etc cooperative side we have not only me but we have a gentleman by the name of christian Zhu who's in china and he's essentially doing the same stuff i do on the western side of the world he does on the eastern side of the world in china korea and japan and yeah that's those are the main teams i don't think i'm forgetting anybody of course we also have you know parity develops uh node software for etc too it's honestly the software that i run the most of i probably have about a dozen parity nodes and a several geth etc nodes too but yeah uh shout outs to parity for being such a great team <laughs> yeah i mean uh i know like 60 percent of like the nodes on ethereum classic are even running parity nodes so like you know i think they've done a really good job of like it, like if, if i feel like if they hadn't built in and like continued their support for ethereum classic like we wouldn't have have like this much this many nodes and people like even aware of ethereum classic if like you know one of the major clients wasn't running it uh, another one i've heard of is uh the ethereum commonwealth or ethereum classic commonwealth uh well, is that also one of the like main dev teams? So they're not a main dev team. They, up until recently, maintained uh, Classic Ether Wallet and Classic Mask. Classic Mask, they've sort of stopped maintaining or halted maintenance on. Uh, and then Classic Ether Wallet is still maintained by one of their members. And yeah, they don't do any of the core network development, though. They did some of the side wallet stuff and we they were particularly necessary helpful at the start when we weren't sure if my ether wallet was going to support etc and that type of thing now it's obvious they have and support a lot of other coins too but yeah that's what uh ethereum commonwealth has uh been involved in but now they've pretty much shifted focus to callisto so they don't work on as much etc stuff anymore I also heard that MetaMask will be soon uh, supporting Ethereum Classic as well. Is that true? Yes, hopefully. So there's a PR, but uh, Dan Finlay obvious, uh, justifiably said that the PR was too complex and we need to break it out into different PRs for different parts of the features. So we need to do that. And then hopefully we'll be able to get ETC into MetaMask. So what's it like having so many teams working together in tandem? I mean, is the is the cooperative playing a role there and sort of doing some kind of project management or is this happening more organically amongst the teams? The cooperative is doing organic project management, most definitely. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's there's a there's a lot to keep track of, and then there's, you know, we're working I'm working with Darcy and Kevin, who are my main contacts on both ETC Dev and IOHK to streamline the process a bit. You know, there's still a bit of a, there's still some friction that we're working out, but we're, we'll get that solved. But yeah, right now, since March, when I started, it's been, it's been a fun few months getting started up and ready. So you, you talked about friction. One, one thing that I wanted to ask is, you know, regarding the, the Ethereum community, um, you know, for those of us who don't actually work and like build code, you know, build stuff and like are coding, you know, what's, what, where is their overlap with the sort of uh, Ethereum community, uh, sort of broader Ethereum community 
uh, and where are the, the friction points? Tell us about you know the interactions there. What is that like? Yes, so I wouldn't say there's that much friction between ETC and ETH. I think when it comes down to any blockchain or any sports team or anything else, any political party, you have this small core contingent of true believers who believe that anything that isn't them is bad. And they have a very outside, vo out oversized voice and tend to influence a lot of discourse online. But I would say for most everybody on the Ethereum and Ethereum Classic side, while we don't really agree on everything, and yes, yeah, some people are a bit more combative and some people are a bit more friendly, there's not as much uh, animosity anymore. I think there was a lot of fighting at the start because it was like kind of going through a divorce. Uh, there was a lot of bitterness on both sides, but we've all, we've kind of gotten over that. And now I'd say we're even okay-ish friends. We're actually at the ETC Summit going to be having Virgil Griffith and Bob Summerwell uh, of Ethereum coming and talking about, you know, working together more. And Bob, I'm sure, is going to be talking about being nicer to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, as a Canadian, I would I would assume that's probably you know, what he's probably best at there, <laughs> being nice to each other. So it, it, you, were, you were recently at, at EdCon in Toronto, uh, and you spoke there, I believe. I, I read a blog post where you said that actually sort of like Vitalik and and some other uh, key figures in the Ethereum community came to your talk. Um, tell us, uh, what, what was that like for you to be there at the conference? What was the reception? What, what, what was your talk about, first of all? And then what was the reception to it? Yes, so the talk was about just how very similar ETC and ETH actually are. So when you look at us code-wise, we're very highly compatible and interoperable. Same with a lot of other uh, Ethereum-based software forks. And there's this kind of thing where because we formed our own different groups, we kind of stop collaborating and working with each other, which seems rather unnecessary because you have these open source projects and it's kind of like, uh, you know, somebody went to your GitHub repo and forked it and now is maintaining a whole separate code base when maybe you don't need to for every single case. There are probably are cases where it's necessary and makes sense, but there's a lot where it's just a natural thing of we became each each other's other. And so my talk was on that. It was also to update everybody there on where Ethereum was. In, I mean, where ETC was in the sense of its development and community and that type of thing. And overall, the reception was great. Everybody was welcoming. Uh, there were maybe two or three people who were very standoffish. And that was a little weird. Like I would walk into a group and start talking to people and there were two people who would always find a reason to leave uh but other than that everybody else was great i'm very happy that they had me uh virgil was the one who invited me to his conference and that's also why virgil's you know of course invited to our conference now and but at the start i got i can say i was a little nervous i just figured that I didn't, I really thought most people were going to respond nicely to me and not have any issues. But in the back of my mind, I was like, there's one guy here who is just a diehard Ethereum true believer who is going to try and start an argument with me. So I was prepared for that and it never happened. So it was actually great to see. Cool. Cool. Could you tell us a little bit about this uh, ETC summit? Uh, I know there was one last year as well, and unfortunately, I was—I really wanted to go, I couldn't make it. Uh, you guys are doing another one this year, so could you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, what, what about the summit, where it will be, uh, what is the sort of the goal of the summit? Like, what do you hope to achieve by getting like everyone in this community in like one 
geographical location for a short period of time? What's the what do you want to see come out of that weekend or week? As far as the ETC summit itself goes, yeah, we're holding it in Seoul, South Korea on September 12th and 13th. The reason we picked Asia and particularly South Korea is because we want to do more outreach internationally. When you look at a lot of cryptocurrencies, a lot of stuff tends to be based in the US. So we wanted to go somewhere else for, for our conference. There's also a lot of trading activity on ETC in South Korea, but I feel like the trading out activity actually outweighs the actual knowledge of ETC and other cryptocurrencies. So I think it's important to inform people that, yeah, you're trading these things, but here's why they're important beyond the fact that you can maybe make money on them. Um, and that's not an endorsement saying you can make money on cryptocurrencies. You can also lose money. Uh, but <laughs> what we wanted to do too is bring together a lot of different people. So ETC obviously doesn't have the same level of funding as a couple other blockchains, but we do have a good amount and we want to use it responsibly where it's most important to be, where, where the impact of it is the biggest. So we don't want to just uh, do something where we start a gigantic fund and throw money everywhere. We want the best bang for our buck here. So what we're doing is we're pulling together the developers, we're pulling together general users, we're pulling together a lot of businesses, and we're pulling together people interested in the financial aspect of ETC as well, and presenting talks that at the very least all of them should appeal to any general audience and then each audience in and of themselves has some talks that may have extra appeal to them. So, for example, we'll be going through the developers' roadmaps. We'll be, ETC Labs is going to be talking about their new projects. Uh, ETC Dev is going to do live demonstrations of IoT and then talk about Emerald Project and sidechains. And then we have a couple talks on why maybe immutability matters and how forks work. Uh, you know, some of the, I don't want to say ideology, but for lack of a better word, the ideology of blockchain. And then some of the finance stuff on kind of market dynamics and ETCG, which is the publicly traded derivative of ETC that's traded on OTCQX right now. And we're even going to have a really nice talk on ASICs and why they matter and are they dangerous being given by another company, Lindsay, that's interested in producing ETC ASICs. And yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. Cool. So like, you know, it seems really cool that this is, we kind of like a bringing together of the uh, Ethereum Classic community. You know, you mentioned all these different people that, like, you know, we're going to have developers there, people who are interested in the financial aspect, people who are interested in like businesses. Um, what do you think it is that like brings people into the Ethereum Classic community in the first place? Like, is it normally just like speculators or, you know, is it more like me? Or my, my reason was mostly like uh, idealistic reasons and stuff. Uh, what do you think is like usually the... Uh, what is the driving force of the growth of the Ethereum Classic community or the current community? I don't know if there's one specific thing that drives people. Like you said, different people have different motivations for doing things. And I think that's very good for ETC because we're trying to be this very general blockchain slash mission critical computing platforms where if you have something important you can use it so i don't know if there's any specific draw for etc but there's a lot of things where etc appeals to a lot of different people for different reasons so we've touched a lot on on the community aspect of, of, of etc but i wanted to sort of circle back now and come back to the, the project itself and I mean, at the origins, uh, ETC uh, was uh, sort of created out of the 
DAO hard fork. The, the original idea was very much ide ideological. Um, and this was the difference in ideology where uh, parts of the Ethereum community were for the fork and one part of, the, of, of that same community uh, was against the fork. But now that we're sort of one year, I think one year and a half in. It's actually the two year anniversary coming up. Okay, right. So the <laughs> time flies, right? So now that we're two years in, both projects uh, sort of have their own development communities and their own product product roadmaps, um, and potentially even, you know, as a product, as a as a as a developer product, very different um, value propositions. So I'm interested in hearing from you, sort of, you know, how how do you sell ETC to someone? Say someone comes up to you and says, "Hey, I want I want to build the next killer DApp," and you know, I'm considering all these all these platforms, right? Whether it's uh, you know, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, or it could be like Cardano, it could be EOS, whatever. Like, how, how do you sell ETC to someone as the platform on which they should build their DApp? Okay, so uh, one, just to go back to the DAO, I would actually disagree and say that the split was really close to 50-50. There's just a lot of people willing to go along with the hard fork because it's easier and more advantageous in other ways and that's up to them and their own uh way you know whatever is most valuable to you but how do i sell etc well for a lot of blockchains right now what they do is they focus on the end user and within etc and maybe within like the bitcoin community for example you actually see this thing where that to us, and I don't want to disparage anybody else who's focusing on solely the end user right now, but that's kind of putting the cart before the horse. So what Ethereum Classic wants to focus on is machine-to-machine -machine communication and IoT types of things where you can take the benefits of blockchain and use them. You can use blockchain to your benefit and do it in as seamless and transparent of a way as possible. So on your side as the developer, you might need to invest some time in making sure that these things run smoothly and laying the groundwork and your back end uh, rather than using solely the ETC chain itself as the back end for everything. Because right now what we see is there's a trade off when you're programming distributed applications is that if you want high degrees of distribution and decentralization then you sacrifice the total processing power you know you have the processing power on any any really distributed trustworthy system your processing power isn't very high when you go to something like eos uh then your processing power can be a lot higher and you can maybe use EOS as your back end, but you end up uh, dealing with the whims of the 21 validator nodes. And so there's trade-offs there, but ETC is there if you want to have trusted computing and then do it in a way that, you know, it's trusted and distributed uh, but you don't need to do everything on main chain. So one of the main things that ETC is going to be focusing on, and I'm sure ETC dev could speak to this much better than I could, is side chains and the ability to do most of your computation off chain, gain your speed benefits there for when you, when you need speed. And then when you need trustlessness, you can use the main chain and interact in, with that in a seamless way such that if you have something on your side chain and you want it back on the main chain uh, so that everybody can trust that everything's working right or being or that nobody can revoke it from you then you move back to the etc main chain so really our core benefit there is that you get a lot of control over the data that you need but you get trustlessness when you need it. So is, is this something that you consider to be sort of a, a core differentiator then with ETC, uh, say, compared to Ethereum, for instance? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I would say that for the most part, when I see dApps being built on 
ETH, they tend to be very, very focused on the core user. And that's not a bad thing, but I think that focus right now is not going to work out because that focus puts them in a situation where they're using ETH as the back end for everything. And they're hoping that Plasma is ready in time and deployed on main chain and working right. They've essentially written something for a super slow database and they're waiting for that SQL upgrade to come and make everything work. But right now, with, with even minor, mild usage of dApps on any truly distributed blockchain, you end up with very high fees and a very long wait time. So ETC is aiming to avoid that issue. I'm sorry, just I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean by they're focusing on the on the core user. On the end user. So they're focusing on things that the end user can go and use immediately. And then they're using the Ethereum blockchain as the full complete database for everything. And that's not going it doesn't it doesn't scale. Blockchains don't scale well. Uh anybody who tells you a blockchain scales well right now is selling you something that's not True. And I don't actually think that Ethereum is selling that their blockchain is scalable today. They know it's not, and they're working on Plasma and other things to address that. I just don't think the timing's going to work out well. Okay. I mean, okay, so perhaps Sunny uh, has a bit more insights than I do on this. But I mean, from, from, from my perspective, so Ethereum is working on, on these off chain solutions as well. So you, know, you mentioned Plasma, but there, there are other projects that. You, you, you could use with Ethereum or you could use sort of as a, as a side uh, chain, something like Truebit, for example, to do complex computations. How is that? Okay, of course, these projects are not built by Ethereum, but I think I'm quite sure you can use them with uh, Ethereum uh, to, to perform computations, more complex computations off chain. How, how is that different? And how is sort of ETC positioning itself as a better competitor on this front yeah so okay obviously there are other ways when i said plasma i actually should have said casper i mix up my terminology it's just that plasma is using a type of casper consensus algorithm so i got a little confused there but uh going back yeah there are other scale off-chain scaling solutions the way etc differs itself there is that we're going to do it in a way that it's very seamless, so our off-chain uh, processing and EVM and Sputnik VM all execute the same as the main chain. The only difference is who has control to change those side chains versus the main chain. So it should make development on ETC very smooth. But of course, I'm not familiar with every off-chain scaling solution on Ethereum, so I couldn't speak to and properly compare all of them. So, um, you know, I saw one of your tweets a few, uh, just, I think, a day or two ago was about, like, how Augur is using, like, you know, they just released recently, and it just uses, like, an absorbent amount of gas to, to just deploy a contract. Uh, I tried to deploy a contract the other day. It was, like, 6 million gas or so. Um, so is one of... The, you know, at Cosmos, uh, which is where I work, uh, you know, one of the, our philosophies is that like smart contracts are, are really meant to be used just sort of like that as contracts. Like they're meant to be this like one time use thing where you really need scripting capabilities. And then when you want to build applications, you really want to build them on these like application specific side chains, like side chains that are designed not with a VM or something like that. Uh, for a specific use case. What are your thoughts on this? And then uh, is the goal for the Ethereum Classic side chains to focus on EVM side chains or these application specific side chains? I agree with your analysis there exactly, like 100%. But so the goal for ETC side chains is to do application specific side chains. So Plasma, for example, is a uh, sidechain for Ethereum that attempts to be one holistic whole and achieve finality throughout its operation. Whereas ETC 
if you have you know your auger you launch it on your own side chain and then if you have your golem you launch that on another side chain right and so uh to build these application specific blockchains are you guys developing uh tooling around this uh for example like you know i, I know something about this a project called emerald sdk i don't really know too much about it is that kind of in the realm of like helping people build application specific blockchains or uh can you tell us a little bit about that Yes, yeah, so ETC Dev could speak much better to this than me, and they actually have a dem a very early demo GitHub called Sidekick is I think is the name of the repo where they have some of the documentation on how the sidechains uh will work. But yeah, Emerald's project is intended to be a way to wrap up whatever etc dev produces such that you have these very easy to use very portable and consumable objects that let you do everything from and i don't want to overstep my bounds but i would assume uh manage a side chain to uh have your have a cohesive ui design to manage hardware wallets addresses talk to the different networks and all that all that stuff so yeah i think emerald sdk is going to be a whole cohesive way to tie all their tooling together but i'm sure they'll also be talking about it a lot more at the summit and we'll have a live stream of it too if anybody wants to watch and learn before we start go continue talking about side chains i think the design of side chains really depends heavily on uh consensus mechanisms um, and so, you know, one thing I've always noticed within the uh, Ethereum Classic community is that uh, you guys tend to be much more pro proof of work than, uh, let's say, the uh, general Ethereum community. And could you explain a little bit about uh, why that is? Is there any thought like, of like, you know, switching to proof of stake and after maybe, you know, let's say mainnet Ethereum switches and like, it was a resounding success. Is this something that Ethereum Classic would be uh, interested in looking into then? These are obviously my views on why, why we stay proof of work. Uh, for one, like you kind of touched on, proof of stake is in very, very early stages. When it comes to blockchain, the most reliable, longest running consensus mechanism that we have is proof of work. So we want to stick to that now because we don't know the emergent properties of proof of stake. And we, if we're going to keep this immutable blockchain, we need to proceed with caution. And yeah, that's, that's the basic reason why we don't want to do proof of stake right yet. If we saw proof of stake running for a good five or 10 years, me personally, if I saw a proof of stake running for a good five or 10 years, without any major issues or centralization, then I would be more apt to throw my hat into the ring and say, yeah, I think proof of stake works here. But there's, you know, there's a lot of things with proof of stake that create potential uh, centralization issues because, for example, a lot of proof of stake consensus algorithms just in they involve having some of the base currency and locking it up. So when you have a relatively finite base currency, even if even in an inflationary model, you're not going to be, if somebody gets a large portion of that and most people aren't going to care about staking at all and not going to do it, then if you get under my own assumption that's not based on any math if you get 10 or 15 percent of the total uh coin coin cap then you essentially control the network and all of a sudden your coins even though they have this individual value they've all of a sudden acquired this new property that is far far more valuable so if it was a billion dollars worth of coins that you possess all of a sudden those billion dollar coin billion dollars worth of coins might be two or three billion dollars to the right person who's interested or they 
might be so valuable to you in the sense that you have control over this entire network that you'll never give them up and you'll always be that one block producer. So we see that right now on a lot of blockchains like Bitcoin and ETC and other ones where we're seeing some some mining pools having way, way too high hash power and we want to get that down and more distributed. We have the option to get that down by bringing in people who maybe they weren't even involved previously, but they don't require anybody's permission to join and start doing with proof of stake. My biggest concern is that it becomes a very permissioned network. I hope that doesn't happen. I want to see a permissionless decentralized blockchain, no matter what it is. But that's one of my fears personally of proof of stake. Right. Yeah. And you know, these are some of the things that we're trying to tackle at Cosmos as well. With proof of work though, uh, you know, with Ethereum Classic, one of the things that like, you know, always been bugging me a little bit, it's like a little bit scary, is that you, the Ethereum Classic is the, a minority chain on a certain hash algorithm, uh, which means, what I mean by that is like, you know, it has like less than 10% of the hash power of uh, Ethereum. And which means a small coalition of Ethereum miners can suddenly uh, 51% attack uh, Ethereum Classic. Uh, there was a cool website that just came out like a month ago that like showed like how much it would cost to uh, like dump to 51% attack uh, different chains. And Ethereum Classic was like, you know, one of the top chains on that uh, thing. Um, so what are your, uh, what is the community's thoughts on this? And has there ever been discussion of, you know, hard forking the proof of work algorithm, especially now that there's rumors of like ETH hash ASIC miners. Um, I also know that there's one mining pool that has 46% of the hash rate, which to me was a little bit, little bit I was taken aback by a little bit. Um, what are the thoughts on this? As far as 51% attacks, obviously 51% attacks are always an issue for your network. The things though that I think we need to remember about 51% attacks is that one if you get exactly 51 percent of the network hash you're still depending on some luck that your attack works i you it you're depending on luck in the short term so when you look at crypto 51.app they have the cost per hour if you want to increase your luck you need to go for longer in order to act in order to reliably pull off your attack I don't know what the exact numbers are on there, but uh, I actually like looking at crypto, crypto 51 because it's very interesting. I just don't know if the prices they have listed there are fair. But that aside, 51% attacks are still, of course, an issue. So there are different ways to handle it. Monero, for example, when they found out there were ASIC miners, they went and did a hard fork. They had a couple reasons for that one of them being kind of ideological in that they want to resist a six for as long as possible even though i believe their devs also believe a six on proof of work are inevitable uh the other one being technical because something like crypto night is uh very asicable uh i think some people who are probably listening don't realize that there's different levels that each of these algorithms could be ASIC at and uh crypto night was one that could be really ASIC, kind of like bitcoin with the shot 256 mm -hmm. and so as far as etc goes we're not too concerned about 51 percent attacks for example even on crypto 51 you need a twenty thousand dollar investment for at least an hour's worth of 51 percent attacks and you need to have if you're going to 51 percent attack you still need to have a lot of etc so the fact that it's rather expensive to acquire and that such attacks are difficult to pull off maybe not too technically difficult but particularly difficult in getting away with your stolen goods uh when you consider every major exchange does kyc ammo most people that have access to that type of capital to reliably pull off a 51 percent attack are probably better served by just mining or something to that effect 
and i think you see you know very very small networks get get 51 percent attacked but i don't think you'll see ones get it if there's not a two or three hundred percent at least surplus of available hash rate i think that's when you end up in a very dangerous situation and then as far as asics go we don't think that the best approach is to resist them uh we think the best approach is to get as many asic manufacturers working on et hash mining so what we want to do is we want to get as many m different manufacturers and mining pools using asics as possible and producing them as possible because right now for example we have et hash and the two things you could m reliably mine with this dagger hashimoto hashing this consensus algorithm is uh you can mine with amd and nvidia cards if either amd or nvidia became super interested in mining cryptocurrencies there's your 100 percent control of the network you don't even need both of them you need one of them to decide that we're producing mining hardware and they could pump out their own asics and run them themselves so we don't think uh while gpus are great right now we don't think that long term they're that great and they also waste a lot of electricity for the amount of hash rate they produce so we'd like to see asics which are far more efficient uh producing more hash rate for the same amount of energy use or potentially less and those are my thoughts on asics of i of course don't speak for the entire community but the majority are pro staying proof of work for a variety of reasons i wonder if in in some scenario like I mean, of course, as public companies, uh, NVIDIA and, and other chip manufacturers um, have a, an, obliga an obligation to make uh, a, you know, as, many prof as much profits as they can. If at some point it became obvious that by simply shifting all of their production, rather than selling those cards, shifting that production to uh, mine cryptocurrencies, you know, one could demonstrate that they would make more profits than they currently are actually just selling the cards to like whatever gamers or whoever uh if shareholders could um force them or not maybe not force but like through some legal mechanism uh pressure pressure them to uh to uh actually like shift their business to crypto mining yeah absolutely i mean it's a it's a potentiality it's probably a little far out there because gpus are such a reliable system but or such a reliable market for them, but I could definitely see a situation where, you know, maybe they you st they start to dip their toes into GP into ASIC manufacture. It's really not hard for somebody like an AMD or an Nvidia to scale that up. So you know, fifty one percent attacks are like one type of attack. Um, another like you know semi related uh topic i wanted to ask was i think i like you know i brought it up on twitter with you a few weeks ago but you know recently there was this like bug in the parity client where they were essentially like literally just not even verifying signatures um and you know in ethereum luckily parity was like you know it's less than half the hash power but on ethereum classic parity you know miners actually make up the majority of the hash rate uh, and, you know, like I said, majority of the nodes as well. Um, and so I was like wondering, like, you know, I found the bug within like a couple minutes and like, you know, I wanted to like try to see like, you know, could I pull off the attack on the test net just to see like, oh, did I actually find the bug? And then I was thinking to myself, like, what happens if someone attacks Ethereum Classic on the client side code? Um, what is the community response to that? So clearly we can tell that like if, if there was a EVM level, like a, a, a smart contract bug, the Ethereum classic, um, you know, philosophy is no, that's part of the thing. Uh, you should have audited the code. Does that, but does that reasoning also uh, stretch into the client code? Is it the user's responsibility to be uh, auditing the client code and making sure it's bug free? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yes. Yeah, so. I think it's obviously that 
that bug was crazy. Uh, props, though, to a couple members of Parity re reaching out and letting us know and informing in a way such that we were able to get the major mining pools updated. Once they were updated, that you know closes off the vulnerability, so it closed off pretty quick. I couldn't believe it when <laughs> I saw these messages, though. I was uh, beside myself. Um, but yeah, it was. We got a pretty quick response there. As far as that goes, though, the no, I would say that if there was a blatant bug in a client software that that violates any of the rules, the pre-agreed rules of the network, like we're validating transactions that shouldn't be validated, that under the de facto rules are incorrect, then no, we should absolutely fork to fix that because you have to fix bugs in all software and bugs do occur. It's just, it's not the, res it's not the network's responsibility to fix a smart contract level bug. That's the responsibility of whoever deployed the smart contract. There are ways to deploy smart contracts in very mutable fashions as we're seeing currently with like bank or freezing funds and that type of thing. Um, and there's trade-offs there, but as far as the base system itself, if there's a bug in the base system, you fix it. Even Bitcoin, which has been a hundred percent immutable since its start about seven or eight years ago, had a buffer overflow attack that created billions upon billions of coins out of thin air. They f immediately forked the blockchain five hours later and achieved the longer the higher difficulty and that became the canonical chain and that transaction no longer exists. So there's also precedent for that being an acceptable route. And I would definitely agree with that type of route. Uh, as we get to the close of the episode here, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about sort of uh, your point of view regarding um, how ETC can continue to remain relevant uh, in, in the broader ecosystem, especially when, uh, Ethereum is, I guess, taking up a lot of the mind share when it comes to sort of blockchains on which we can deploy smart contracts. What What are your plans here, and what are some of the uh, things that you can point to uh, as sort of indicators that ETC is and can and will continue to re remain relevant in the in the ecosystem? Yeah. So, I mean, one big one might be the Coinbase listing. Uh, one of Ethereum ETC's biggest issues that it's had to deal with for a long time is that it in my mind unfairly did not have access to those fiat pairs that a lot of the other bigger cryptocurrencies had access to and i think we're not we're not at any risk of losing relevance now and i think we're in a position where we're going to gain a lot of relevance we now have a lot more attention being paid to etc we have we're on every major exchange we are developing dev tools we're seeing partnerships we're seeing interest from asic manufacturers we're seeing etc dev for example starting some pilots with openstack we're gonna see etc labs come out with a bunch of projects now i think we're only going to gain relevance and i think we're already a lot further ahead than people sometimes think we are because we were all conditioned from a very early age in blockchain to go look at coin market cap and compare market caps but when you look at the proof of work coins the top four are all of the coinbase pow coins in, in terms of volume and the fifth pow coin is ethereum classic where actually a rather well-used chain relative to many of them. We do more transactions per day than Bitcoin Cash, uh, considering the fact that we're account-based and, and, and Bcash is UTXO is kind of interesting that we even beat out that because being account-based, you have a lower threshold there. And yeah, there's a lot of, interest and activity in etc now and now that we're able to increase our awareness i think we're only going to see us 
gain relevance rather than lose it. And it's really great to see uh, keeping this immutable philosophy going into blockchain because I think we need to reach a critical maxima where blockchain has distributed itself throughout society and only at that point are we going to be able to say immutability and that type of thing is guaranteed so i'm really looking forward to seeing etc gain more and more relevance in the market cool so when you, you talked about coinbase is that something that uh they did on their own or was there some sort of interaction with uh members of the community was there lobbying uh being done for them to uh to list uh atc etc doesn't lobby its coin like at all you see so many other cryptocurrencies they hop on your like tags and stuff on twitter and ruin all your searches and tweet deck but no uh we had no idea what was it it was on the 12th i think I just came home that day and I was just up all night answering questions and talking to people and completely unexpected. I don't remember what time I ate dinner that night. Uh, but yeah, no, there was no there was no lobbying or anything that I'm aware of to get ETC listed. I think they just looked at the coin itself, saw that it had had a long history of existence, saw that it did very decent volume relative to other coins despite not having these fiat pairings, and all those things, and then some added up to their decision. At least that's my view on it. I don't honestly know. So tell us, uh, what's the development roadmap um, you know, for the foreseeable future, and where can people get involved if they're looking to either you learn about ETC, contribute, build apps on the platform, etc. Yeah, so if you're looking to get involved in ETC, go to ethereumclassic.org, check out all of our resource links and our community links. There you'll find Discord channels, Telegrams, everything to talk to us. I personally am one of the admins of the Discord, so if you want to ever reach out to me or some of the ETC dev people, we're, we're over there. As far as the roadmap goes, obviously we're going to, you know, build out side chains and we're going to have Emerald Project to make development easier. And then beyond that, we'll just have to wait and see. There, from what I understand, there are a lot of projects interested in ETC, so I'm looking forward to seeing what they are and seeing them develop. Great. Well, Anthony, thanks so much for coming on the show today. It was great to. Uh... To finally dive into ETC, I mean, we, we, we've had, as we mentioned, Charles on uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, and you know, we, we did have some discussion about ETC, but we never really had a full-length conversation about, about, uh, about the platform. So it was great to uh, learn more and looking forward to seeing uh, what arises in the future. Yeah, thank you both for having me. It's been a great talk. And thank you to our listeners for once again tuning in. Uh, episode releases episodes every week and you can uh, find us on iTunes, SoundCloud or wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on YouTube so you can watch us there at youtube.com slash episode of EPC. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter as well at episode of EPC. and if you're looking to support the show obviously you can leave us an iTunes review. That's a great way to uh, get people to know the show and we're also very always, always very happy to see your reviews. So thank you so much and we look forward to being back next week.